Moon Age. Oh, is this the cool? If this is what? I th yeah. Okay, we had to see this one. We had to see this one because this is a cool image. So this is the lunation, and it's going like wicked fast. But you can see from this, uh, this is over the course of a single set of phases. Moon's appearance changes nightly. This time lapse sequence shows what our moon looketh like during a lunation, a complete lunar cycle. As the moon orbits the Earth, the half illuminated by the sun becomes increasingly visible, then decreasingly visible. The moon always keeps the same face towards the Earth, roughly the same face towards the Earth, because you can see this oscillation uh, that comes from, I will show you what that comes from in a minute, or I will explain to you what that comes from in a minute. Uh, the moon's apparent size changes slightly, so you can see it kind of getting big. In this case, it's biggest when it's new. Um, so when you can't see the moon, it's when it's closest to the Earth. Um, and then the wobble called a libration is discernible as it progresses along its elliptical orbit during the cycle. Sun reflects from the moon at different angles, so it illuminates different features differently. A full lunation takes 29.5 days, just under one month. Parentheses, moons, because that's where it comes from. Okay, now why does the moon uh, go like this? Okay, we know why, uh, it's, well, it's the same reason that it gets bigger. So we are going to do a brief description of what's going on here. So we have la lune, uh, here's the earth. So this is earth. And then you have la lune going around the earth like this uh, on an elliptical orbit. It's not this, this is an exaggerated elliptical orbit, we can, but we can pretend. So the moon always, the average orbit of the moon or the average rotation rate of the moon matches its orbit around the earth. So. Uh, the moon will um, keep the same face towards the Earth basically at all times. Uh, however, uh, and that's the average uh, compared to its orbit. However, because the orbit is elliptical, it will move faster over here, fast, and it will move slower over here, slow. And so when the Earth is orbiting more slowly, it's going to be rotating faster than its orbit. So that means that it's going to be rotating faster than its orbit, which means that this thing is going to start pointing, uh, like the person, the observer on the surface of the moon is going to start pointing uh, behind the Earth. Okay, And then as it comes in here, in this portion here, it's going to be orbiting faster than it rotates. And so it orbits faster than it rotates, and so that is going to um, mean that the rotation is going to go slower than the orbit, and it will start to uh, point in the opposite direction. So you're going to get this, it will speed up, uh, you'll, you'll start to see one side of the moon, or the moon will start to go advance beyond, uh, keeping the same face towards the earth when it's going slowly, and it will fall behind when it's going more rapidly, and so that's how you get this thing oscillating back and forth. Now an elliptical orbit, um, to first order, or like a reasonable approximation, especially when the ellipticity of the orbit, the eccentricity of the orbit is small, is that the deviation or the rel the difference between the rotation rate of the moon and the orbital rate of the moon is going to follow some sine function, sine omega t, uh, where this is the orbital frequency. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if it's a highly elliptical orbit, then it won't follow this. But with a moderate, like a small elliptical orbit, it will follow this. Uh, the amplitude of the oscillation from one side to the other, like how far it goes, is going to be proportional to the eccentricity. And so you're going to get some function like this that describes how far the moon advances or recedes as it orbits around. Um, the next correction would be of order the eccentricity squared times you know, some terms that are, will involve sine functions at probably twice that frequency, uh, maybe three times the frequency. I haven't worked out the math, but either two or three. Well, in this case, it would be twice the frequency. Uh, if this term is zero, if the sine component, if the sine term here is zero, then it would jump to e cubed with uh, three times the frequency. But anyway, so here's this e squared. So the next, um, the deviation that this has from having having a pure kind of oscillatory uh, appearance would be at second order in the eccentricity. So if you have an eccentricity that's like 0.1, then this term, uh, the correction will be only like 1%, 0.01, because that's the way that it goes. Uh, oh, direct link. <clears throat> yeah, okay, there you go. So the, it is uh, whatever that's called. The lunation, August 10th, 2003. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's cool. That's what's going on there. 
All right, and you can see here the difference between a regular moon and a supermoon. Is the, the regular moon is like this, and the supermoon is like that. Okay. Let us not have that going on in the background. It's cool as it is. It might get distracting after a little while. All right, let's move on to new stuff. So the stuff we're moving on to today is we're going to finish up some stuff with ray optics. We're going to talk about how the eyeball worketh. Um, and then we're going to uh, move on to uh, other aspects of optics. We'll see how far we get um, in this one today. Whoops, I apologize for that. Okay, here we go. Optics. The basic idea of, or the premise of optics, at least the way that it was originally envisioned, is you have a source over here, source, and then it's going to go through some stuff right here, and it comes out and like the image, okay, and there's a bunch of rules for what happens in here. The thing that's important to recognize is that the light traveling from the source to the image is going to be, okay, hold on a second, there's a question here. It seems to oscillate up and down. Is it because the Earth orbit is not aligned with the rotation of the Earth? The Moon's orbit is not uh, aligned with the rotation of the Earth. Probably some of that, uh, probably some of the, um, I, I suspect that that's mostly what it is, is that however the person's latitude is relative to the moon, he keeps his camera pointed in the same direction um, in order to take that image. Um, and so it does, you will get some oscillation based upon where, uh, how the moon's orbit is oriented, how the tilt of the moon's orbit is oriented with respect to the earth. So yes, you get the oscillation side to side, which is the eccentricity of the orbit. And then you get the oscillation up and down that is from the inclination of the orbit. Okay, so with uh, this geometric optics, a few things to keep in mind. So here's a mirror. Mirror looketh like this. Here is your source. The light comes off, bounces over here, comes over here to an image. You get this thing called, well, I don't know what it's called, some kind of law of reflection that says that the angle relative to the normal, this angle here, is congruent to this angle over here. Uh, and that's because that's the way things are. Uh, what this does is actually makes it so that light takes the it takes the smallest amount of time for light to travel from one point to another. Um, is it the smallest or the, I think it's the smallest. It's an extremal amount of time, pretty sure it's the smallest amount of time um, to go from one point to another uh, off of this mirror. So if you went this way, um, then that would be a longer distance. However, there is a different interpretation to what's going on that's actually the, the more correct interpretation. So this is with ray optics. With ray optics, you have light shining off of here and light coming back here, and it's an extremal amount of time um, where the this distance plus this distance is going to be... Is it, hmm, we should figure this out. It might be the longest, it might be the shortest. So let's figure this out real quick. Okay, so uh, one one can add here. One can add. There you go. There's the one. Right. So then there's this one. So it goes. This is the square root of five. That's that length. All right. Here we go. This. Anyway. So that's the square root of five. This length right here. And this is a one. That length right there. And so you get one plus the square root of five. And so the correct answer is that it does take indeed the shortest path between the two points. <sighs> oh. Now we, now we got to figure it figured out. So one plus the square root of five is indeed larger than the square root of two. So uh, we got that figured out. So light takes the shortest path between two points, um, given a surface upon that it can reflect across. And so if you have a surface, and you have a source up here, and this is like uh, water or something like that, so it's a refractive surface and instead of a reflective surface, and you have a point down here, what is going to happen is that light is going to travel. Uh, the ray of light that gets to this point is not going to go straight. Okay, this will not happen. The reason that doesn't happen is because light is going to travel more slowly in this area. The speed of light in a vacuum is C. The speed of light in some medium is um, C sub N, where N is the index of refraction. It's a number that's bigger than one. Uh, well, bigger than one for the group velocity um, of the material. So if it's water, n is equal to, now this is c sub n, which is actually equal to the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction. And n for water is like 1.3, n for glass is about 1.5. Um, and so that tells you that 
uh, light in water travels 30% slower than it does in vacuum, and light in glass travels 50% slower than it does. Um, well, okay, I lied. That's that's not. So light in water travels 25% slower, uh, and light in glass travels 30% slower, right? So this is roughly equal to four thirds. So you get three three quarters of the speed because it's one over this three quarters of the speed, and this is uh, three halves, and so you get two thirds of the speed. So light in glass travels at two thirds the speed of light. Light in water travels at four third or three quarters the speed of light, and so this means that um, when you are light, it will take longer for light to go from this source down here to this point than it would if it were to travel a longer distance at a faster speed and then bend downward like that. Okay, and so you get this thing called Snell's law, which is the ratio of this angle to this angle. Um, that, anyways, that tells you how refraction takes place. And it, it actually gives you what the um, index of refraction is. This is how you measure the index of refraction. You shine light in at a known angle, and then you measure the angle of the refracted beam. And that ratio of those angles is going to be um, give you the index of refraction. Uh, Snell's law is what, like n1 sine theta 1, where theta is this one, uh, is equal to n2 sine theta 2. And so if you use it, if you start with a vacuum up here, then that n1 is going to be 1. And then, you know, so you can solve this uh, fairly readily to measure the index of refraction. Something. So it's easy to do. OK, um, another way to think about this is like, when you drive to work, uh, you spend more time on the slow side, on the slower road than you do on the faster moving road. And so this gives you the, the fastest time, fastest travel time between these two points. But there's more to it than this. So you can also use conservation of momentum and conservation of energy to derive this. You can say that uh, energy for a given wavelength of light energy is squiggles the frequency, squiggles the frequency. And so uh, energy is conserved, and so you track uh, the frequency is going to stay the same, but the wavelength is going to change, and so the momentum, uh, the momentum squiggles what one over the wavelength, and you can derive this same expression, uh, the same Snell's law expression, by uh, conserving energy and momentum at every point. So there's all sorts of ways to to do that. Well, at least there's a couple ways to do this. There might not be infinity ways, but there are a couple ways to derive this uh, relationship, like the effect of refraction. However, what's actually going on here, this is the classical version of what's going on here. The quantum mechanical version of what's going on here is even more interestinger, and that is the following thing. In quantum mechanics, you say, okay, here is my source, and light is actually going to follow all possible paths. So here are all the paths that light, this light can take. It can go like that. It can come down here. It can loop around. It can come over this way. It can come in like that. So here's my source, here's my light source, here's my detector over here. Light can travel in all sorts of paths to get from one place to another, and they are all equally valid. However, in the end, what you see over here is the sum of all possible paths. And so you have one path that goes like this, you have another path that goes like this, and you add them together. So the result is going to be, it's going to be equal to um, path one, uh, what should, how should I label it? How about just P1 for path 1 uh, plus P2 plus P3 3 uh, plus P4 and, and so forth. That's a 2, by the way. So all of these paths, oh, I'm hiding the 4. All these paths are equally likely. They're all equally valid. However, they all also have, each one has its own phase. So this is going to be e to the i theta 1, e to the i theta 2, e to the i theta 3, and this theta here is the phase, the quantum mechanical phase that advances as this photon moves from one place to another. So now you're adding all of these different things up. You're adding these all up. All the probabilities are equally likely. Each one is equally likely, except that they all have some phase associated with them. And when you add them together, uh, two paths that are, uh, what you find is the phase that advances so if you were to plot the phase um, for different paths, you will get something that looks like this. So you have a bunch of different paths. 
and these are the phases that are advanced by different paths okay when they're all added together and down here some of the phases are going to be similar to each other so you're gonna have one path that looks like this and you're gonna have another path that's very close to it that's nearby that looks like that and they are gonna advance in phase um, almost the same amount so there's gonna be very little difference in the amount of phase that is different between these two uh, so the phase in this context the phase in this context is the advancement of the quantum mechanical phase of the light ray another way to think about it, it's also basically like what phase is the photon in um, is another way to think about it um, but there's a quantum mechanical phase that says here my photon has some wave function and that wave function has you know some some state like some polarization state and it's going to advance in time with e to the i um, theta where theta is some function of time as you advance in position okay so you add all these things together paths that are similar in phase um, are going to contribute and paths that are different in phase are going to add so these things will add coherently the two that are close together will add coherently the one that's out here will add randomly so it will add in an incoherent fashion so it turns out that when that the shortest path like the path that takes the least amount of time is going to be located right here that's the smallest advance that you have have in the phase and the paths that are around it you'll notice that here the slope is zero right the tangent to this curve is flat like that which means that if you were to change the path a, path a little bit and you advance the phase a little bit the paths that are near this minimum uh, are going to if you deviate a little bit from it the change in the phase is going to be small right because it, it has a horizontal tangent so a small deviation is going to have no change uh, in the vertical direction on the other hand if you were out here if you had a path that was out here and you have a slight different difference in the path out here the difference in phase is going to be like that okay so here's the difference in phase there where here the difference in phase is negligible uh, yes we did decide which which one is theta this is theta over here this is theta that one is theta these are the different paths okay so uh, the ones that are out here that are far from the minimum are going to have when you have a small change in the path it's going to correspond to some uh, linear change uh, there's going to be some advance in the phase where the ones towards the minimum that have the the minimum path here when you advance the when you change path you have a neighboring path you're going to have a negligible um, change in the phase so all these phases right all the values of theta at this location are going to be similar in size even though you might be deviating by a fair amount in the path that you're taking where the ones over here a small change in the path that you're taking corresponds to a decent size change in the theta that you're uh, advancing. So as a consequence, all of the paths that are out here are going to add incoherently. So they're gonna cancel each other out as much as they combine. So you add them together, sometimes they'll be close enough to being in phase with each other, sometimes they won't be. And so um, the point being that you're adding a whole bunch of random phases and they cancel each other out. So these things cancel each other out. Uh, these ones here add together. So when these ones combine, um, they they add coherently. And so the probability is going to be the square of all these different amplitudes. Like which one is it? You, you square them all up and then um, you look at which ones are most probable. The ones that are most probable are the ones that add coherently down here and not the ones that add incoherently out here. And that corresponds to the classical path. So when you have um, a mirror, for example, the light ray is going to come in like that. It's going to bounce off of it. And all of the paths that are near the classical path are going to um, combine. And all the ones that are far from the class, they're going to combine in a constructive way so that uh, everything adds together. Um, everything adds in phase with each other. And the ones that are going off of these weirdo paths, they're going to add out of phase with each other and so these all these paths are going to cancel each other out and you're left with these ones that add coherently so the same thing is true with any quantum mechanical system any quantum mechanical system is going to have some phase that advances with it the phase is um, given by e to the i s where s is the action 
the action is equal to the integral, not that you need to know this, but it's the integral of the Lagrangian um, over the path length. Um, I think it's written like this. Um, and so you, the, and the Lagrangian is the difference between the potential energy and the kinetic energy. So you uh, add up the difference between the potential and the kinetic energy, you integrate it across the path that you're thinking about, that gives you the action for that path, that action corresponds to the phase of the wave function. Uh, you have to have the right units. So this has units of energy times time. The action has units of energy times time, and there is a fundamental constant in the universe that has units of energy times time, and that fundamental constant is Planck's constant, h-bar. Okay, so there's to make the units come out right, you have an h-bar in here. And this is the important thing, right? This fact right here is, uh, that's the thing that sets the scale of when does a path, how far, how much do you have to deviate from one path before you add incoherently. So let's take a look at this again. I had made a, um, a statement on a, a much earlier stream about the fact that if you have a bowling ball, so here's a bowling ball, and here's your thing, and you have some pins over here, okay, what actually happens when you release the bowling ball and the bowling ball comes this way is that the bowling ball takes all possible paths to get there, right? It goes around the earth backwards. Uh, the bowling ball takes all of these paths. Okay, but each of these paths has its own action, right? Each path has its own quantum mechanical phase. So you have all these different quantum mechanical phases, and then you say, okay, which one um, actually took place? Which path was actually followed, or which one do we actually observe is the real question. Which of these paths do we actually observe? And the answer is you observe all the ones where the quantum mechanical phases add coherently and not the ones where they add incoherently. And so each one of these paths has its own action, right? So there's an action for path one, an action for path two, and so forth. And that gives you the e to the i thing over h bar, et cetera, and so forth. And so what you want is which one of these trajectories gives you the smallest difference in the action relative to the size of Planck's constant. So because Planck's constant is small, then the deviations between these paths before they start to add destructively is also small. If Planck's constant was gigantic, then you could actually perhaps see all the bowling ball take all of the paths simultaneously. But Planck's constant is tiny, which means that even a small change in the action when you divide by this tiny number um, will correspond to winding up uh, the phase by some arbitrary amount. And therefore, all those paths will add incoherently. And the classical path is the point where when you look when you plot this action which is the quantum mechanical phase classical path is the one that will be at the bottom of this and uh, only small deviations from the class classical path are uh, ones that you would observe so uh, there's a question here something completely unrelated to optics what's the frequency of the gravity waves and what causes it uh, frequency of gravity waves depends upon the source uh, how fast the objects are going around each other that will give you the frequency and uh, what causes it is it's a distortion of the path that light would take as it goes around that system. And we see that distortion in the path that light would take in the detectors. So they travel at the speed of light because that's what's getting distorted, or that's what's being distorted. Okay, so let me get, just give you an example real quick. So if we have, um, here's an action, and let's say that we're dividing it by some number that's small. And Planck constant is really small. It's what, like 6 times 10 to 20 something or other? What is Planck's constant? Pla uh, Planck, Planck constant. Planck's constant 10 to the minus 34. So that's a small number. All right. So, but let's pretend that the Planck's constant wasn't that small. Let's pretend that it was like one. Okay. So if Planck constant is one, so we're saying h is equal h bar is equal to one. Um, then what this says is this thing here, this action, which has got units of energy times time, um, if the energy times time of a path, of, of a given path, um, so it's like the phase space volume that you're traversing because you've got the potential and kinetic energy difference here um, multiplied by time across the, the path that you're considering. So if you have energy times time of one path that is like 10 and energy of another path that is like uh, 10.1, then the difference between those two would be 10 minus 10.1 divided by, and in this case, we're, we care about Planck's constant. So you look at that difference compared to Planck's constant, and you get this. And so you end up with uh, 
0.1 over 1. Okay, that's a small deviation. Okay, when you look at uh, like sine of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, it's around 0.1, okay, which is kind of a small number. Um, this is, uh, it's basically you compare this, you compare this at 0 0.1 to a radian, because a radian is the only way that you measure angles. Uh, you compare 0 0.1 to a radian, and that is a tenth of a radian, which is not very much. Okay, let's suppose that you have a separate path, two different paths, and now this one is 10, and the second one, instead of being 10.1, the second one has uh, like 12.2 uh, or something like that. Okay, now you subtract the two. So you got 10, point, uh, 10 minus 12.2, and that gives you 2.2 divided by 1, a, a difference of 2.2 divided by 1, and that is bigger than a radian, right? That's 2.2 radians. 2.2 uh, radians is, what, like there, a radian is 60 degrees, so 2.2 radians is something that's going in this direction. So this path phase, the, the phase of one path and the phase of the other path are totally different from each other, and so they add incoherently. And they, the average of all of these different angles is going to be zero, because for every uh, phase that you have that points in this direction, you're going to have a nearby phase that points in that direction, and they're going to cancel each other out. So once you start adding things incoherently, the average over all nearby paths is going to uh, average to zero. So when you have big deviations relative to Planck's constant, um, then the paths add incoherently. It's only for small deviations relative to Planck's constant where it adds coherently. So the smaller you make Planck's constant, the closer together the different paths have to be. So uh, since Planck's constant is, instead of 1, it's 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus 34, or something like that. So now you have the action, the energy times time for one path, and the action for a neighbor or another path, not necessarily neighboring, but another path. The phase of these two things adding together could be a small number. You, you might find that the phase is 0 0.001 difference, or like the action is difference between this path and this path is 10 to the minus 3, but then you're going to divide it by 10 to the minus 34, and that's going to be a gigantic number, right? That's 10 to the 30, what? 10 to the 31? 10 to the 31 is a huge number. 10 to the 31 radians means that you've completely me messed up um, the, the phases next to each other. They're hugely different. And so it's only those paths that are right near the optimum path, like the minimum of the action. It's only the paths that are near the minimum of the action that will add coherently, where you actually get differences in the path, uh, the differences in the action, here's the action, um, from deviations from the classical path that are small, so it's only these paths down here where the difference in the action is small compared to Planck's constant. And therefore, that's what you observe because all of these ones, um, all the paths that are far uh, away from the classical path, they add incoherently and only the ones right next to the path are right next to it. Okay, here's a question. The path that we observe always lie within the span of the available paths that are within Planck's constant of each other. Okay, if you were to, okay, so if you've understood, the path that we observe, so like the classical path that we observe when we step outside and watch a bowling ball go down the thing, or if you're bowling outside, uh, or like birds flying from this, falling from the sky, or rain, apples, and very small rocks, um, they are ones where the action um, between the two paths, the difference in the action between the two paths is smaller than Planck's constant. Is that what you said? That lie within the span of available paths, so you have a, an an ensemble of available paths, and the action that you get for each of those paths, that like each one has its own unique action, and as long as the action that is, the differences in the action of those paths is smaller than Planck's constant, then they will add coherently. And so that's what's going on. And that's true with bowling balls, and it's true with photons. Now what you can do <clears throat> is you can choose an interesting structure. You could make a mirror, for example, where here is um, your source and here is your detector. Instead of making a mirror that looks like this, where the light will reflect off of you know a single point like that, what you could do is make it so that um, you know because what about light that comes over here and then goes that way? Can can it contribute at all? And the answer to that is. Uh, yeah, what you can do is you can make a mirrored surface that looks like this. Uh, you can do it better than this, but you can make a surface that looks like that. Where now the light will be coming off of one here, and one there, 
and one here, bouncing off. And you, you actually can see that there are different paths that form from each of these surfaces and that the light will bounce off each of those surfaces. The light doesn't actually go just straight to the middle and up to the other side. It actually reflects off of each of these surfaces. And what you'll get is you will concentrate the light at a given location, like that. You'll concentrate light at a given location as long as the path from each of these uh, rays, so the phase that you get from each of those rays, uh, is an integer of 2 pi uh, away from the next one. So you'll get this path, okay? And then this path right here, as long as the difference in phase that advances from one path to the next path is a multiple, so like the delta phase is equal to 2 pi times some constant, some integer, um, then they will add. They will all add together coherently. You've removed by adding in these divots where the light's gonna bounce in a random direction, um, all of these things are gonna get reflected away and you set up a situation where you can get light traveling along. It shows that you can get light traveling along each of the paths that we originally described. You're setting up a situation where they can add co they're can add able to add coherently because you're eliminating all the nearby paths that would add destructively to the system. Okay, so now you can have uh, and what you'll get is that some wavelengths will concentrate here, but if you have a longer wavelength, then these paths no longer work, and you have to have the light reflecting off of this surface. So let me give you the difference. So here's that thing that I set up, okay, where I have these different uh, flat surfaces that are connected like yay. Uh, I probably should have drawn it down. I'm going to draw it lower in the, on my screen. So here's... Here's all these different flat surfaces like this. Here are the uh, things that I've cut out from it. So you typically will use a diamond and you'll scrape uh, down. And what do they call these things? You rule, it's called a rule. Um, and you just do cut a straight line in the diamond or with a diamond. Okay, so one wavelength of light will correspond to, you know, so these two path differences here and the path difference as you go here like this. So these things will all add and for one wavelength of light these will be uh, advanced 2 pi times you know times k and so they will all add here. On the other hand if you have a different wavelength of light that doesn't correspond to advancing by a full wavelength. Instead you have to it will be the light comes up here so now it's a different color and it will be over here. The light will come down bounce off of this and it will combine over here. And now these path length differences correspond to an integer, a multiple of two pi, but it's for a different color. And so if you have a different wavelength, it will be at a different location. You know, an intermediate wavelength will be here. A shorter wavelength will be over here. And so what you can do if you have a surface like this is you can uh, have white light, like all colors of light emitted. But um, if you have a flat mirror, here's your white light source, you'll get a reflection like that and there's your detector. That's where all the white light combine. If you put in these rulings on the surface of your mirror, so now your mirror has those rulings in it, you will separate the colors out and you will be able to pick out where certain colors line up and where others don't. And there's a name for this. The name for this type of mirror, a mirror that looks like this, is called a diffraction grating. A diffraction there's an I in there, probably a T somewhere too. Diffraction grating. So diffraction gratings are a way to kind of demonstrate the quantum mechanical behavior of the light. You put in these rulings, um, that means that you're basically having a whole bunch of different sources and where the light of a given wavelength will appear is where the path length differences between each of these things uh, corresponds to an integer multiple of the wavelength. So, so this is a diffraction grating. Uh, let's see, kind of an aside on the current topic. You mean, have you done some reaction in the past? Does information Reddit comment seem correct to you? I'll have to take a look at that comment about, everybody likes liquid thorium, thorium molten salt reactors. Um, I will take a look at that at, at the end. Uh, now, so, okay, so here's a question. Um, <clears throat> uh, what about a concave mirror? So a concave mirror does indeed, uh, well, okay, so what does a concave mirror do? So now you have, with a concave mirror, you have a surface that looks like this. 
and you have light coming in uh, from a source and it will bounce off of the concave mirror to some location in the center like that um, and you'll get different paths will end up at different locations the different paths of light will end up at different so presumably the lights coming in you know here's the central axis the axis of symmetry uh, even though I didn't draw it like that uh, but light coming in at different angles will actually focus they will combine at different heights above that uh, source um, if you have uh, now there's two reasons for this one of them is if you have a source that's where the light is spreading out so if you're very near um, the mirror then the light's going to spread out and then going to be focused at some arbitrary spot like this you can also have light coming from infinity so like coming from a great distance so here's your concave mirror light's going to be coming from a great distance which means it's all basically coming in parallel but the same thing will happen if it's a spherical mirror so this is a sphere then the light will come in and it will light coming in from different areas will focus at uh, slightly different locations and so as a consequence even though something from a great distance would be focused or you would imagine that it should be focused you should be able to get a good image of it your mirror surface is going to uh, focus light coming from different locations at different heights um, slightly different heights and so you, it blurs the image so your image gets spread out in a way that you may not want this is called spherical aberration S spherical that's an e aberration that's that says aberration uh, I should probably spell it out at least once aberration so a spherical aberration is the distortion you get you can't form a good image um, if you're reflecting off of a sphere uh, because a sphere doesn't have the property that lines coming in parallel will reflect off the surface uh, to a single point there is a geometrical shape where lines coming in parallel will reflect uh, off of that surface to a single point, and that is a parabola. So if you look at the geometric definition of a parabola, the geometric definition of a parabola is it is the locus of points that are equidistant from a point and a line. So this point here is called the focus. Focus. Uh, that says focus. Even though it looks like it says foods, it actually says focus. Focus. Um, and then you have this thing here. This is called the directrix. Direct. Directrix. That's a D. Directrix. It doesn't. It, even though it looks like a B, it's actually a D. So the focus and the directrix. So you have the parabola is the set of points. It is the locus. So locus means collection of or set of points. It is a set of points that are equidistant from this point and that line. So that and that it's this will be equal to that distance if you draw it correctly and this distance here and that distance there that will be equal to this okay so that is the definition of a parabola a consequence of that is that when um, light comes in that's parallel uh, to the axis of symmetry um, will reflect along this line here okay because if it comes in parallel then it's going to match this and then if you do Snell's law, then you'll find that, that this implies that the normal to the surface is pointing in some direction. Um, you can also do this, you can solve it with, uh, what's it, algebraic geometry, or yeah, algebraic geometry, where you put in the x, y's and you find the slope of the line and do that kind of stuff. You can also solve this with um, geometry, uh, with saying like parallel lines cut by a transversal, then alternate interior angles are congruent type stuff. So you have this line here that, is parallel to this one because so, that's what you said that the line lights coming in parallel to this one so that's uh, two parallel lines here's a transversal and that implies that this angle is equal to this angle and then you can do the um, that implies that you know this and that and the other and you can do the geometry I've done it in the past it's just been the last time I did it was 2003 um, and so uh, but anyways, you can do a geometric proof the same way they do in ninth grade geometry to show that these things are um, the, the thing coming in parallel off of a parabola will all meet at a focus. But it turns out that a sphere is actually slightly wider than a parabola. And so um, the farther you get away from the central axis of a sphere, the more aberration you get in the spherical aberration. Anyway, so that's spherical aberration. And that was answering the question, um, what happens if you have a concave mirror? Is that um, you have 
spherical aberration, you also have another aberration, I don't remember what it's called, uh, where because not all sources are at infinity, so you have a, a source that's like this, um, even though it might be some great distance, that as it comes in, the light's coming in um, at a slight angle. And so as a, because it's coming in at a slight angle, it's not reflecting directly towards the, the focal point. And so what you get is a depth of field uh, where s objects at a certain distance, um, you know, you tune your, well, in the, in the, so this is with a mirror. If you had lenses and you were trying to get the same optical results from lenses, then you would have some depth, some band of depth where the light coming in would be able to focus. And so you have some region where things are in focus and stuff where it's out of focus. So that's the depth of field. Um, this is the, the case for a, a mirrored surface. Um, you can basically produce the same kind of results with a lens, a, a series of lenses that do this. Okay, here's a question. Um, wondering, since the angle of a mirror is a macroscopic feature of all molecules grouped together, so how does such a small photon see that angle and reflect accordingly? It seems like the photon angle would be meaningless. That is a great question, and uh, Puzzle Gamer, and that's basically what we, we did describe it. Uh, the idea is so that you actually have all the surface, the whole surface, you have all these molecules that make up that whole surface. And the, the path that we observe the photon to take is the path where the quantum mechanical phase of that photon is going to advance. Um, there's a minimum in the quantum mechanical phase of adjacent paths around this, the classical path. So if you look at the quantum mechanical path, the phase of the wave function for these different paths, you get a minimum like this, and all of these things will add coherently, and so that's the path that you actually observe. All these things out here will add incoherently because h-bar is small, right? You have to, it's theta over h-bar that matters. Um, and so because h-bar is small, then it only takes a tiny deviation from one path to another before they add completely incoherently, and then they all and then those ones all cancel. So these cancel, these ones add coherently, and that's the path that you actually observe. And so it actually does reflect off of all surface, like everywhere on the surface, but only the ones that add coherently are the ones that are actually we actually observe because the rest of them cancel each other out. Okay, let's see. There are some other questions. Uh, and is it still... Uh, is this still refracting very high and low frequency wavelength threats? Could be employed another apparatus, just IR imaging. Okay, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about um, what happens with, with lenses. So lenses are slightly different than mirrors. Mirrors, the surface of a mirror, so here's a mirror. It's got some surface that you put on it. Uh, most common surfaces is aluminum because aluminum is cheap compared to silver, you could use silver on the mirror. Um, and each of these different substances that you coat your mirror with has different reflective properties. So if you looked at the reflectivity as a function of wavelength, um, so this is short wavelengths over here, and this is long wavelengths over here, uh, you'll find that different substances are gonna have reflectivity curves that look you know, however they look. Um, and usually they're pretty flat, so that I, that was probably a, a disingenuous drawing, but it's usually pretty flat for a while, and then maybe you, it falls off at longer wavelengths. And so then what you do is you say, okay, well, this is the visible part of the spectrum, uh, like this, and notice that it's fairly flat across the visible spectrum, but it declines in some areas. Or you might get something that looks um, a reflectivity that, that looks like this and maybe declines a little bit, um, and then this is the visible part of the spectrum. I think with, we can look it up. We'll take a look at it. Um, the reason that silver looks the way that it does, it's kind of like a, it's not white, because perfectly reflective would be white, right? You, you shine white light on it from the sun, it would reflect white light back at you. And so a perfectly reflective surface would be white. Silver does not look white. It looks kind of a bluish color. Um, and so it actually reflects less in the infrared than it does uh, in the blue side of the spectrum. But nevertheless, it's, it's the difference between 99% and like 95% um, for that. So if you were, and then it, silver might fall off more rapidly once you get past the infrared, or like past the red part of the spectrum and into the infrared. And so if you were designing an infrared telescope, like say, hmm, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, then you wouldn't coat your mirrors with silver because James Webb is specifically designed to look primarily in, well, 
to, to do well in the red part of the spectrum and the infrared part of the spectrum. So you want better reflectivity over here so that you're not losing stuff to the atomic nature of the mirror coding. So the uh, mirror on James Webb Space Telescope is going to be coded in gold, which you can tell just because of the fact that it's kind of yellowish that it reflects better in the infrared and the red than it does in the blue. So let's take a look at those uh, just briefly while we can. So if we look at the reflectivity of silver, and aluminum and silver are going to have similar reflective properties. Um, thank you for those gifts. I appreciate that. Um, so let's take a look. Images. All right, here are aluminum, gold, and silver. Just what we were looking for. So we'll open this image in a new tab. I don't know whose image it is, but it's ours now. So visible light is basically from 300 nanometers. So this is 200 nanometers, this is 300 nanometers, 300 or 400 nanometers. So visible light, I guess, is kind of starts in this area right here. And then it goes to about 800 nanometers. So the visible part of the spectrum is this part right here. Um, if you squint really hard, you can see 800 nanometer light, but it's way at the edge of what's visible. A micron, I mean, basically, between 0.1 and 1 microns is kind of what spans the visible range. So you can see um, silver and aluminum are similar in their reflective properties because, okay, so here are the details actually matter. Uh, so 400 nanometers is right here. So we go up this 400 nanometer line and you'll notice that aluminum is um, up here and silver is a little bit lower. So aluminum is at 90 something percent reflective at uh, 400 nanometers. 95 or 90 something. Uh, silver is around, is just over 80, so what, 85% reflective. Um, and then aluminum is fairly constant, and then it dips down a little bit here in as you get to the red end of the spectrum, right? So the red end of the spectrum is like um, 750 nanometers, 700 nanometers. So this is one micron, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. So this is the 0.7 rand. So the visible light is actually fairly narrow. It's just this, on this plot, well, you can always make it as big as you want by just changing the axis that you're scaling. But the visible part of the spectrum is basically between that line and between this line. So aluminum is pretty flat across there. And so that's good. If you have an optical telescope and you're looking in the optical spectrum, then you're not getting losses from the reflective properties of your mirror. You're actually um, doing quite well at reflecting most of the light that hits the surface. And it does decline as you go towards the red side of the spectrum. Okay. Um, silver uh, is less reflective than aluminum here, but it's um, it, but it does also do fairly well across uh, most of the visible spectrum. It's better reflective in the red part of the spectrum. Um, and then, you know, for longer wavelengths, they don't, they all do equally well. Gold, on the other hand, gold is different, right? Gold doesn't turn on until green light, green light at 500 nanometers. So gold doesn't, is a very poor reflector in the blue part of the spectrum, which is why it's gold. It's why it's yellow colored is because it doesn't reflect any blue light or it reflects a small amount of blue light compared to the amount of light that it reflects um, in the longer wavelengths. So if you're building a telescope like the James Webb Space Telescope that's designed not to look in visible light but to look in the red part of the spectrum and the infrared part of the spectrum, gold does better by a long shot. I mean, so this is 90% for aluminum at 700 nanometers and it's like 95 or 99% for gold. So gold does really well up here. It's the most highly reflective of these three at that uh, location. So there we go. That is why you choose different coatings. Um, aluminum is less expensive than these other ones. And so that's typically the one that's chosen because it's relatively flat across the visible spectrum. Um, OK, so uh, what did that have to do with anything? Oh, so. Uh, lenses, uh, we, we haven't talked about refraction uh, in a great detail yet, uh, so I guess I'll, we, we did bring it up. Uh, refraction is the fact that when you come to a transparent surface, so here, this is a transparent surface now, the light will refract, it will bend uh, relative to the normal. So you'll have one angle here and this angle here, and whichever one has the highest index of refraction, the light will bend more towards um, that direction. So this angle here is going to be smaller than this angle up here. Okay, And that all comes down to the same idea that light actually travels through all paths and then the one where the, diff the difference in the phase between adjacent paths is tiny are the ones that are going to add coherently. Um, and that's the, 
what you actually observe because the rest of them all cancel each other out. Okay, so that gives you the um, the behavior of light as it, uh, what was I talking about here? So that gives you the refraction. It turns out that the behavior of light as it travels through some kind of transparent medium like glass or water depends upon the wavelength of the light that hits it. So some wavelengths of light will bend more than others. So it turns out that the index of refraction is not just a constant. It, what's, what you look up in a table is an average, but the index of refraction actually depends upon the wavelength. Okay, so it might be 1.5 for green light, but it might be 1.55 for red light. And so red light will bend differently than green light will, depending upon the nature of the substance. Typically with most things that we come across, so glass and water, um, oil, something like that, the index of refraction, uh, the, the stuff that bends the most is the shorter wavelength. So blue uh, has a higher index ref of refraction than red. Um, and that will cause the light, white light coming in will break into colors that move out at different angles, uh, depending upon the index of refraction of that specific wavelength. So you'll have a continuous index of refraction that depends on wavelength. Blue light will typ typically bend the most. Uh, red light will bend the least. Um, and so it spreads it out into color. That's called chromatic chromatic aberration. So chromatic aberration is um, what, what happens if you take a single lens. So here's a lens and uh, the light coming in of a variety of colors is going to reflect or is going to form an image at different locations. So you might get a blue image here and a red image here. Okay, so instead of it being a spherical aberration, which is the fact that not everything focuses at the right location, um, regardless of the color, this is saying that it's a chromatic aberration where the difference in the focus depends upon the wavelength of light. So this is why this, the reason that the moon is red during a lunar eclipse is because of chromatic aberration, that the blue light focuses um, closer to the earth and the red light focuses at the distance to the moon. And so as the, so here's the earth, sunlight comes through the atmosphere, you're going to get um, refraction from it that depends upon the wavelength of light. The blue light is going to refract more than the red light, so you get chromatic aberration, and then the moon is going to sit here and be illuminated by the red. So you can adjust for chr chromatic aberration a number of ways. One of them is to um, have coatings on the surface here that allow light to um, transmit, you know, it forces certain wavelengths to transmit uh, certain ways. Another way to do it, um, I mean, that, that gets into the details like optical engineering that I am not very, you know, that's not what I do. Um, so there are things you can do with coatings to help resolve chromatic aberration. Another thing you can do with chromatic aberration is put in a series of lenses. So you have a series of lenses that might focus and then defocus and then refocus the light. Um, and they're chosen so that um, blue light comes in and then gets bent in some particular way you know, so you, you bring the light in, then you expand it back out, and then you bring it back in again. Um, and it's these uh, lenses are chosen so that even though the red light is going to refract differently than the blue light, by the time it goes through the series of lenses, then they will all focus at a single point. So when you look at a, um, if you look at, for example, the cross section of the dark, energy camera the dark energy camera has a series of lenses in it uh, those are not a series of lenses and neither is that well anyway so the dark energy camera has a series of lenses in the top let's see if we can find um, uh, lenses Well, okay, so here's a not the dark energy camera, but here is a digital camera from Nikon, apparently. And you can see that it has this, this series of lenses. My suspicion is, I, don't, I can't guarantee this, but I'm pretty confident that the reason all these lenses are like this is to deal with, well, for one thing, this might have a telephoto lens, like where you can change the focus and the zoom. And so you have to have lenses that allow it to focus at different depths or different distances. But also you have to deal with aberration. You don't want to have um, a blue image and a red image that are 
separate from each other. They focus at different lengths. And so uh, some of these lenses are designed to um, correct for chromatic aberration. All right, DSLR dark energy camera. Let's see. Uh, there are some questions here. Uh, during the movement through the glass, light cannot be a particle. Uh, during the move, yeah, during the movement through the glass, light is a particle. Um, in fact, one way to interpret the index of refraction is to say that the photon gains a mass. Um, it has like an effective mass because now it's moving slower than the speed of light. When you pass into an index of refraction, the light moves more slowly. Um, and I mentioned this before, that the speed of light in the index is equal to the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the index of refraction. Um, so this is slower than the speed of light. And so you can say that the photon actually gains the mass um, or an effective mass, and that's why it's moving slower than the speed of light. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Uh, and then the, it, the thing would be a particle. But I mean, fundamentally, it's not whether it's a particle or a wave. The quantum field theory would say that there's an electromagnetic field and the photon is a vibration of the electromagnetic field or a, um, an os a, uh, excited state in the electromagnetic field. Let's see. Some atmospheric distortion doesn't help. OK, so atmospheric distortion, the thing that you see with atmospheric distortion, as long as someone brought it up, is scintillation. So you have density variations in the air because you know sound waves are density variations alone, and um, but you can also have high dense, high energy or uh, high pressure and low pressure regions that are have different densities. So, anyways, the air has different densities in different locations, and so when you're standing down here on the surface of the Earth, looking up into space, looking up into space, uh, the light is actually going to refract by around these different density regions. And so here's this star in the distance that stays fixed. And you're looking at that star. You're looking at the average position of the star. And the light that's coming into your eye is actually being refracted by each of these different layers slightly differently as they pass by you. And so the star is going to appear brighter or dimmer based upon whether the light is pointed in the right direction or not by the time it reaches your eye. And so stars will twinkle. Stars twinkle because it's a single point source. That light comes through the atmosphere. Like you're looking in that direction and the light gets bent around by the atmosphere and causes it to twinkle, uh, causes it to twinkle. If you look at a planet, planets, um, even though it might not appear to the eye that they are bigger, planets are going to be, if you look at it through a telescope, planets are definitely bigger, right? You can get Jupiter to fill the whole eyepiece in the telescope, where a star will always look like a dot to any telescope that you'd have in your backyard. So because this is bigger, you still get the scintillation, you still get the distortion effect, but it's a, a small effect compared to the size of Jupiter. And so um, Jupiter planets don't twinkle unless you have really big distortions in the atmosphere. Um, planets don't twinkle. So that's one way to tell the difference between stars and planets is to look and see if they twinkle or not. Uh, let's see. Are there any other reasons to get through atmospheric distortion observations? Uh, are there other reasons than to get through atmospheric distortion for observatories to build in high places? Uh, so part of it is atmospheric distortion. Part of it is also opacity. So opacity is what fraction of the light can make it through, what fraction of light at a given wavelength can make it through. And so uh, if you look at the atmosphere, the atmosphere has some opacity that depends upon wavelength. Atmosphere opacity. Okay, this is the common image. We'll steal it from the European Sub Southern Observatory. So this shows what fraction of light makes it to the surface. 0% uh, um, of the light makes it to the surface if, you're, if the wavelength is too short. 0% um, if the wavelength is too long. You have a big thing in the radio, so we can build radio telescopes on the surface of the Earth because uh, the Earth is, is transparent to radio, but it's opaque to these other ones. and so. At different wavelengths, you might have you might land in one of these bands where only 50% um, of the light makes it through. So, like at uh, what around 100 microns, um, only 50% of the light at that wavelength will make it to the surface of the Earth at 100 microns. But if you build, so you have a mountain now. So this is depth. This is the transmission from the surface, or like from the atmosphere, the top of the atmosphere, all the way down to sea level. So what you can do is here's a mountain. 
and you can build a mountain to get up of, above 50% of the atmosphere or even 30% of the atmosphere. And then uh, all of a sudden the atmosphere becomes more transparent than it was before. So instead of being 50% transparent, you can get it to be 80% transparent, something like that. So by building telescopes up on mountain sides, not only do you overcome the distortions from the atmosphere, the, the scintillation, but you also deal with opacity. Uh, the Earth isn't necessarily transparent to radio. A lot of military radars use atmospheric reflection. Okay, now there's a difference. There are some layers in the atmosphere of different, you know, atmospheric chemistry is its own unique thing. There are different layers, like there's the ozone layer, there's layers that have sodium in it and stuff like that, where if you, those specific layers might have certain opacity uh, differences for different wavelengths. And so you can bounce um, light off of uh, those different things. So if you want, so for example, the sodium layer that's up there, there's a green um, laser beam that people use to do atmospheric measurements where they shine a laser beam up and it bounces off that sodium layer and comes back down. And so that with adaptive optics, if you look at an adaptive optics system, um, Keck adaptive optics laser, so you'll see images of telescopes with a green laser beam shooting out of them, like this. Okay, so what that's doing is it's light from a laser beam that goes up into the atmosphere, bounces off that uh, layer in the atmosphere, comes back down, and then you take an image. You know what the laser beam looks like when you send it out. You take an image of the laser beam when it comes back, and you say, oh, here's how the image has been distorted. And then you have actuators on the, you have a mirror, uh, you have a mirror that looks like this. Here's your mirror. Okay, it's small. They're, these are typically pretty small, and they have little active actuators on them. They have little plungers um, with little fingers, and so the light comes back from your laser beam. It went up looking like that. It came back looking like this, and that. And then the computer reads that image back and says, "Oh, okay, this shape is not that shape. How do I correct it?" And then it sends information to these actuators and actually distorts the sh surface of the mirror, changes the shape of the surface of the mirror to remove that effect so that the light coming in from a distance um, is uh, the aberration from scintillation is corrected. And so then you get higher resolution images because you're not limited by the diffraction. You're not limited by interference effects coming from the edges of your telescope and stuff like that. So that's adaptive optics. Uh, one of the downsides of this, though, is that adaptive optics works for the central part of the image. So you, you're only focusing on the center part of the image. You deform your mirror with your deformable mirror, uh, deformable mirror, and uh, deformable with a D, DM. So if you look up adaptive optics DM, then you'll actually, well, we can, we can see what these look like. Um, adaptive optics deformable mirror. Yeah. So, and they're they're usually pretty small um, because they're kind of expensive to make. But there you go. So there's your deformable mirror surface. It looks like those things with the nails where you can like stick your face in it and you get the imprint of your face. Um. Anyway, so the deformable mirror. But you choose. Uh, the computer is designed to produce clear images at the center of the field of view. And so the you deform the mirror to correct for the central vision of your telescope and the consequence is that you actually blur the stuff around it. So if you want to have wide angle images that are in focus everywhere, you don't want to use adaptive optics. You only want to use adaptive optics if there's one object and you want to get a really clear uh, picture of one particular object. So um, adaptive, I don't think James Webb does adaptive optics at all because, well for one thing there isn't as much need. Um, I, yeah, so the, James Webb is not going to use adaptive optics uh, because there's no atmosphere to correct for. Um, James Webb, it is segmented, so the mirror of James Webb is segmented, but that um, is so that they can fit it into the capsule that it's going to go up on. So if we look at um, Keck adaptive optics image, so Here's the difference uh, before, oh, no, those are both 
with both adaptive optics images. So that doesn't that doesn't help my story. Here we go. Here's the difference uh, with and without adaptive optics. So without adaptive optics, you get this blurring. With adaptive optics, you get uh, nice and crisp images for the central part of the vision. Um, when you get farther away from this, like out in the periphery of this uh, image, then the image gets worse. So anyways, that's uh, adaptive optics imaging. Is this a Betelgeuse? Is this a star? T 30 meter telescope of what? Okay, anyways, here's before and after. Looks like a blob, and it turns out that it's two blobs. So you can get uh, those kinds of improvements. Oh, that's this is a cool one. So here's a galaxy before and after, and now you can see um, much better resolution what's going on in the, in the fringe like that. All right, how often does the, does the mirror have to be distorted? So these adaptive optic systems, it's constantly. So you'll sample it. Um, I suspect that it probably samples at like kilohertz. Um, so it takes an image and then measures the distortion. Um, you know that you can't go, kilohertz might be a bit fast, um, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be pretty fast because you're integrating, like you're collecting information all the time. You're adding photons to your camera and so you have to correct it in like certainly on a time scale much shorter than the shutter time scale, like how long your images are for. Um, and also on how quickly the distortions pass by, like how fast the distortions change. So if the wind speed is um, high, then you would have to change more rapidly because the atmosphere is moving past your camera more rapidly. My suspicion is that they just say, okay, what's the typical speed with which things move by the move through the atmosphere and then they make a correction because you don't want you know you want your system to operate with not having a lot of knobs on it um, so I don't know the answer to how frequently it does it you can't do it at megahertz right you can't do a million adjustments per second because you'll fatigue your materials so I suspect it's like a hundred to a few thousand times per second something like that so that is uh, that's how adaptive optics works. Now, what did this have to do with what we were talking about? So we were talking about optics. We did mirrors. We did um, things. Uh, we didn't go into how the eyeball works. So let's talk about, we did talk about how the eyeball works last time. Let me see if I missed anything before we go any further. Um, okay, we, we did enough about lenses because they're kind of boring. Um, we did reflection and how it's actually a quantum mechanical thing. Um, we ended up talking about diffraction gratings because uh, we were able to do that. Um, okay, so how the eye works. The eye has three detectors. I think I mentioned this last time. Eye has three detectors. Um, one that detects uh, red, green, and blue. The blue one is actually believed to be the one that um, evolved most recently. Um, part of the reason for that is that there are very few blue pigments in nature. Uh, certainly there's no blue food, right? There's no blue colored food that is not poisonous. Um, so your eyes have rods that detect all wavelengths of light and it has cones that detect a specific band of light, uh, rods, cones. Uh, there are three kinds of cones, the blue ones, the green ones, and the red ones. Uh, this is the reason that you uh, okay, yeah, blue the blue milk from whatever that uh, planet is that Luke Skywalker was on, but he you know he didn't really like it. You could tell, um, and so, anyways, there isn't much stuff that's blue that's edible. Right, there's stuff that's purple that's edible, but not blue. Uh, and in fact, there's only a few animals that actually have blue pigment. Um, and so this is something we'll talk about next time: is the fact that uh, there's a butterfly. Uh, I think it's the olive wing butterfly actually has blue pigment. All the other blue butterflies that are out there. Um, it's not blue pigment. It's actually a pigment of your, it's not, it's not a pigment. It's an optical illusion or it's an optical effect from thin film interference, which we'll talk about later. Anyway, so uh, it's believed that these things, um, that these blue cones were evolved more recently. So that's the new stuff. And as a consequence, you know, nature hasn't evolved pigments to respond to that yet. Um, so uh, red, green, and blue. This is also the reason why RGB is the color scheme that you need in your television. So that you can excite red, blue, or green uh, things with a red, green, and blue pixel on your screen. 
or with channels that are red, green, and blue. Uh, the way that it works is the way that your eye distinguishes like green and red is by looking at what is the relative. So if you observe something at this wavelength right here, then you'll see this much green. That The green will be excited by that much and the red will be excited by this much. And that tells you, oh, there's some green and, and this much red. And so it does a difference. Your eye or your brain subtracts the difference in the red image from the green image and then says, oh, I'm going to conclude, therefore, that this is orange. Okay, where yellow would be here. Yellow would be more green than red. Okay, so you, as you shift slightly from one place to another, the difference between the red and green um, can actually change sign, right? So this is a fairly small change, but the difference between that difference and this difference is enormous because here the red is bigger, so you get a positive sign. Here the green is bigger, you get a negative sign, if you do, depending on how you, which order you subtract. So this is exactly the same thing that you do in astronomy when you have a telescope. Here's your telescope. Uh, it points up like this. You have a, a wheel with different filters on it, and those filters only allow certain wavelengths to pass. And so you'll get a filter that is like the red filter, and it will have a transmission that looks like this. So it only allows wavelengths to transmit in the red part of, this, of the spectrum. And so if you have a star and you want to find out what color the star is, and you have basically a black and white detector, your CCD camera is going to be a black and white detector. So how do you tell that this is a star? Like the ones that we saw at the beginning of the stream, how can you tell if they're blue or yellow? The answer is you look at it in a red filter, then you look at it in a green filter, um, and you see how bright is it in the red filter and the green filter, and then you subtract the two, and that gives you a color, and then you can reproduce the color that you see. Um, so if, if we look at the SDSS filters, so let me go back a few of these. SDSS filters, there's a great image that shows basically the response of the different filters used on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, U, G, R, I, and Z. Okay, so it's kind of blurry, but here you go. So U, ultraviolet here, that's the transmission. Um, what does this say? Filter response. So that's the transmission of the light through a given filter. Ultraviolet here, though so this is an angstrom, so it's you take off a zero to convert it to nanometers. Um, green, green is in this area. Ultraviolet, green, red, right there. Uh, I is the near infrared, and then Z is kind of the intermediate infrared. So that is the transmission of the different filters used by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And other surveys are going to have similar filters, right? You, you choose some chemistry that is going to produce the thing that filters out the light, and then um, that's the response that you get. Um, thanks for all these subs. I appreciate that. OK, so uh, here's a question. But the fact that humans have two eyes, is that a kind of basic naturally occurring interferometer? So the blue eyes is, or like the reason that you have two eyes is for stereo, is for depth perception. It gives you stereoscopic vision. And so you have two objects, one that's near and one that's far, and you have an eyeball here and an eyeball here. The angle between, like where this thing appears relative to the background, so you have some background over here. Um, the difference in the image of this play, this thing compared to the background and this thing back here compared to the background for your two eyes. So pretend that these, both of these lines went through that single point. So the difference in the background image for the distant point is smaller than the difference in the background image for the nearby point. And so that your brain interprets the image that you get from both eyes and then gives you the ability to see in C depth. Uh, so you can do this experiment yourself. You can hold uh, your hands like at different distances. Uh, let's see, so different distances like this. So that's different distances. And then you close one eye and then close the other eye. And you can tell when you have both eyes open, you'll, you're able to see the fact that your hands are at different distances. But when you close one eye, they actually look like they're the same distance. So you, you, do, still see, you do still see color with both eyes because both eyes have their own retina. They both have their own rods and cones. But you don't see depth perception. So the stereoscopic vision is a way of getting depth perception. Just like stereoscopic hearing is what allows you to tell the direction that a sound wave arrives. So sound waves are coming from a particular direction. It will get into this ear before it gets into this ear. And that delay tells you, oh, it's over in this direction. Um, so it, it's, I don't think it's quite like interferometry in that um, here it's just a, a plain subtraction. You're not actually using the wave properties of light. 
So your eyes act like CCDs. They act like actual photon counting devices. Um, where with an interferometer, it's slightly different uh, because there you're actually looking at the wavefront, the electromagnetic field of the wavefront, and then adding the fields directly instead of adding the uh, basically the power or the energy that arrives. Okay, what uh, did we miss anything? So that's the green blue um, thing. I mentioned that color blindness comes from the fact that uh, either these things overlap too much and you can't distinguish between them, so you can put a filter in there to help distinguish between the response of the red cones and the blue cones. Uh, oh, what I was going to mention is that with these different filters on astronomical observations, then you subtract. You measure the brightness of a star in this filter and this filter, and then you subtract them, and that tells you whether the object, so let's say that you have, whoops, not what I meant to do. Let's say that you have two different filters. Um, you have a red filter and, or a green filter and a red filter. So this is green and this one is red. And then the spectrum of light coming from the star is like this you'd say, oh, it's brighter in the red than it is in the green, and therefore that is a red star. On the other hand, if, it, if your star looks like that, if the spectrum of the star looks like this, it's brighter in the green than it is in the red. And so you'd say, oh, this one looks more green. And so having the, um, you know, it's the integral, it's the spectrum of the star times the filter, you multiply by the filter, and where they're both non-zero, you get a signal, and then you integrate across that and get your total signal. So anyways, the total amount of light in the red part of the spectrum here is greater than the total amount of light in the green part of the spectrum over here, and vice versa. And that tells you, oh, this object is more green or more red. So what astronomers call a color is the difference between two images taken with two different filters. Um, so your eye does the same thing. Eye works like a telescope in that regard. Um, now, this is why you have... Uh, red, green, and blue on your telescope or on your uh, television. Um, if you look at the Keck solar spectrum, you'll notice that this is what the solar spectrum looks like. You'll notice that it has three broad bands. Okay, you got red, green, and blue. And the place in between them, the yellow, is really quite narrow compared to the size of the red, right? The red's going to have what, 10 of these things? And then orange and yellow are six of them. And then green is another 10. And then this kind of teal um, turquoise color is just a few. And then blue. So your eyes are, that shows you basically your sensitivity to the eyes. And the transition between the red part of your eye sensitivity, the green part of your eye sensitivity, and the blue part of your eye sensitivity. And then where those, those sensitivities of the uh, different cones overlap each other. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, what? Oh, and so red, green, and blue is what you get for um, if you're emitting light of a given color. Now, when you actually print something, things are different. Life is different when you're printing something than when you're actually shining something. So in the case of a television, you're going to have red, green, and blue pixels. So red, green, and blue pixels. And they can be organized different ways. So sometimes they're organized as like little stacks, um, like side by side. So a single pixel. A single color pixel is actually three pixels, one that's red, one that's green, and one that's blue. Um, there are some people that actually have four cones. I think it's usually women. Um, I know that men are, suffer from color blindness. Women um, tend to be able to distinguish more colors than men do. And I think that there are some that are, uh, I think it's mostly women, but we can look it up real quick just to make sure that I'm not lying to anybody. Um, tetrachromatic. So this would be people with four cones. And so they can actually see more um, colors of light. Now, there are a number of different species that are tetrachromatic. Um, the condition possessing four independent channels for conveying color information, four types of cone in the eye. Um, some mammals, uh, humans, let's take a look at humans. Reindeer are tetrachromatic. Apes, including humans, and old world monkeys normally have three types of cones, which is what we talked about. We are trichromats. Uh, at low light intensities, the rod cells may contribute to color vision, giving a small region of tetrachromagazine color space. Human rod cell sensitivity, it's greatest in the bluish-green wavelength. That's where our eyes are most sensitive. Um, let's see. People with two X chromosomes could possess, so two X chromosomes, that implies female, could possess multiple cone cell pigments, perhaps born as full tetrachromats who have four simultaneously functioning kinds of cone cells. That would be gnarly. 15% uh, of the world's women might have the type of fourth cone whose sensitivity peak is between the standard red and green cones, giving theoretically a significant increase in color differentiation. 
Another suggests that many as 50% of women and 8% of men have four photopigments and corresponding increased chromatic discrimination compared to trichromats. Um, after 20 years of study of women with four types of cones, uh, non-functional tetrachromats, this neuroscientist identified a woman who could detect a greater variety of colors than trichromats could, corresponding to a functional tetrachromat. Um, in her video, what is color? YouTuber something, something, something says was in fact her mother. Anyway, so there's that. Um, so there are, there are animals that are tetrachromatic. Apparently some humans are tetrachromatic and uh, it's mostly women that are that way. And it's mostly men who suffer from color blindness. All right, let's see. So uh, now when you're emitting light, you emit it in red, green, and blue to, in order to get the mix that you want. However, if you are, have an outside source, so you have an outside source of white light that comes in and you're looking at reflected light, you're no longer emitting light. You're, you need to uh, do a difference. So you have a sheet of paper and you want to see a color image on that paper. You have white light that's coming in and illuminating that. You want to reflect, um, you want to absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect others. And so in, instead of emitting red, green, and blue, you want to absorb um, certain colors. And so pigments for toner are actually not red, green, and blue. They are cyan, magenta, and yellow. They're the differences between um, red, green, and blue that you see, and the cyan, magenta, and yellow that you print, so that it absorbs the red, green, and blue. And then typically you'll have a black, so CYMK, K is for black. Uh, the reason you want black is because it takes a lot of ink to, to turn cyan, magenta, and yellow black, and so it's just easier to have a black toner. So it's not technically necessary, but uh, it may, it's a way less expensive to have black toner. Um, and so CYMK is the toner that you use because you're absorbing um, the different colors of light. Uh, where's the toner thing? There's a toner image on this thing, and I don't see it, So, but you'll have to just trust me that it exists. Where is it? None of these things. Anyway, so toner um, works differently than uh, than light being emitted. Uh, this just shows the difference between an incandescent light bulb, a fluorescent light bulb, the sun, and a, a laser beam. So a laser beam has a really narrow uh, band of wavelengths. Um, an incandescent light bulb has a continuous spectrum. The sun has a continuous spectrum. Fluorescent light bulbs have some sharp features. And then it has this also kind of background continuum. That background continuum comes from uh, the stuff that they paint basically on the inside of the, of the light bulb. So with, with your eyes, your eyes are sensitive to you know, these wavelengths and these wavelengths and these wavelengths. And the sun emits a spectrum that looks like this. And so you get some of all wavelengths. And so the sun has basically emits white light. When it's all equally illuminated, then your eye perceives it as white. Um, an incandescent light bulb will have a spectrum that looks like this. So it will peak over here in the red part of the spectrum. And it's not as bright in the blue. And that's why these things appear yellow. Right? It's a mixture of uh, red and green. So an incandescent light bulb appears yellow because it operates at a lower temperature than the sun. The sun is at 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, these light bulbs will be closer to like 2,000 Kelvin. Okay, And so they appear yellow. You could mimic the light from the sun if you either coat your thing with something that will emit in the blue light, um, or if you can choose specific chemical elements that emit light at specific frequencies that concentrate those wavelengths in the visible part of the spectrum. So um, it's less expensive because with incandescent light bulbs, you're throwing away all this energy out here in this tail so that all of this is light that's being emitted by your incandescent light bulb that you can't see. And so it's all energy that um, is just lost into being absorbed by the walls and stuff like that, heating up the room. So you can only see the portion in the visible part of the spectrum. And so if I were to actually draw this the way that it really looks, you'd have red, green, and blue sensitivity here the sun spectrum looks like that. The incandescent light bulb spectrum looks like this. So everything out here gets thrown away. And it's only about 4% of the light that actually lands in the visible part of the spectrum. So incandescent light bulbs are not efficient. So you can choose uh, chemical species to produce spectral lines that concentrate in the visible part of the spectrum. Of course, you can't be 100%. You can't concentrate everything in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, but these uh, fluorescent light bulbs choose specific chemical elements so that there are emission lines, so these are emission lines that are all in the visible part of the spectrum. 
and they come from like mercury and some other things. Uh, or you can make an LED. LEDs typically have emission lines that are narrow. They're not as narrow as laser lines, but they are still relatively narrow. So a red LED will um, give off light in this band of wavelengths. A blue LED will give them off in this band of wavelengths. Blue LEDs were only mass produced, uh, so they were only invented in, like in the 90s. The guy won the Nobel Prize for developing the blue LED, which they, you know, the, the scientists, there were, I think there were three of them, at least two, um, won the Nobel Prize for developing the blue LED, which they should because it's, it's a huge um, piece of technology. Without the blue LED, you wouldn't make LED lights. You wouldn't make LED screens. Well, I guess you would, but they'd only be red and green LED screens. So you needed a blue LED, and then you have a green LED that also has a fairly narrow wavelength. The advantage you get by using LEDs is not you don't have to waste um, energy on these spectral lines that you can't see. You can focus all the light in the visible part of the spectrum, red, green, and blue, or blue, green, and red, um, and nothing is emitted outside of the visible part of the spectrum. And so it's way more efficient. All the light that gets emitted by the LED is in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, there is a power supply that you have to have. So when you have an LED light bulb, you have a power supply in there that um, helps the LEDs shine, that's necessary for the LEDs to shine. So the light bulbs get kind of hot, and there's some energy associated with powering the LEDs, um, but they're still more efficient because they emit purely in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, I don't know why blue is so hard to make. It's a matter of like choosing um, the right chemicals and processing in the right way and doping it with the right kind of stuff. And it was just a matter of you know finding what's the substance that has the right um, band gap. Um, so we haven't talked about atomic structure structure yet, but what's the substance that has the right band gap so that when the electrons bounce back and forth between that gap, it emits the right color of light. Um, let's see. No green stars. There's no green stars because um, the way that stars shine with a black body spectrum. So visible light is here. Green is in the center of the visible light, right? Roy G. Biv. Uh, green is in the center of the visible light. And so stars emit light with this particular type of shape, like this. And so blue stars are brighter in the blue and dimmer in the red. Um, white stars are brightest in the green. And so we would, anything that is bright in the green is, would appear white to us, because that's how our eyes evolved. Um, red stars are brighter in the red than they are in the blue. So that's why you don't have green stars. Um, because green's in the middle part of the spectrum. Not only um, is would our eyes filter it and see it as green, but also uh, the spectrum is flat here at the top. So it's if a star is bright in the green, it's bright all across the visible spectrum. Um, and there's a relatively small deviation, where if you look at the difference between the deviation you get in this part of the spectrum here and the deviation you get in that part of the spectrum for this other star, and it's actually steeper than this. There's a much bigger difference in brightness across the spectrum there than what you get if something is peaks in the green. So that's why. Okay, yes, and that is how neon lights work. So neon lights, you put in specific gases, you send a lightning bolt through it, you get certain wavelengths of light, and then you choose the gases that you want in order to get the colors that you want from that.